Last year, an amateur archaeologist was walking through these woods when he came across a load of lumps and bumps, and they were very lumpy and bumpy. He was told that this site played a crucial role in the defence of this island during the Second World War, and he realised that it needed to be looked at before it was lost forever. So he talked to Time Team about it, and they said that no one has ever dug a site like this before, because although this is British soil, these defences aren't British. They're German, part of the vast complex of defences built by Hitler to turn Jersey into an island fortress. Oh, and by the way, that amateur archaeologist was me. So I'm going to be under quite a lot of pressure over the next few days. 70 years later, the islands are littered with the remains of that occupation. During the occupation period, 40 to 45, we're talking about some 65,000 plus mines being laid in the island and probably over 26,000 tonnes of other munitions. And it means for the next three days, our archaeologists are going to have to be rather careful when it comes to any small finds they uncover. So, are you still happy to go ahead with this? I think I feel slightly more cautious than that, I think. <laughs> so, with the briefing over, it's time to get our first trench in. Now, you say, don't hit it hard, and then the first thing you do is you go... And it's essential we're vigilant, because our site at Les Gillette is a heavily fortified German anti-aircraft battery that overlooked the airport and dominated the surrounding landscape. Now hidden under a canopy of trees, this rare wartime RAF reconnaissance photograph shows the site in its prime, and it suggests it once dripped with heavy artillery. We're seeing a lot more than on that air photo, yeah. Yeah. which must be yeah. a real testament to the German camouflage guys. And we've assembled our own army of experts to decipher all these lumps and bumps. So, with GFIs somewhat kiboshed by the vegetation, we're going for the old-fashioned approach. Our first trench over a possible gun emplacement has gone in based on the aerial photograph and Stuart's surveying skills. And he's already given us a position for a second trench. There's a whole series of structures here that look as if they're buildings associated with the emplacement that Phil's working on. In spite of being only 70 years old, we haven't been able to find any written records for this site. They were probably destroyed by the Germans before they surrendered. Oh, I think you've got it precisely what we had before. But these 20 millimetre diameter shells do suggest that Trench 1 is the site of a 20 mil anti-aircraft gun. And this gun would have been just one of thousands of German weapons that swamped Jersey from 1940 onwards. We've also now opened two more trenches, this time over strange features that John's managed to identify from his severely curtailed Gia Fizz. Ah, lovely. And one of them has just thrown up a find that's got us completely stumped. Wondered whether it was part of a field kitchen, but... That's not going to work for filling it full of uh, soup, is it? So It looks too fragile for something like a gun mounting, doesn't it? Doesn't it just? Well, there's our first mystery on this site. <sighs> yeah. We have two days now, left to find out what that is. And people say, why do you bother digging it? You know what everything is. But we have sorted out Trench 1. Yeah. It's not just a bank that's thrown up to go round a gun. The defense... As Phil's discovered that the defences built on this hillside were engineered to last. What we seem to get is this, this inner stone-built revetment, and then we've got this fine-grained material pushed against the outside of it to make the actual bank. I mean, that makes complete sense. You don't want enemy shell fire or bullets striking stones. So you put the soft stuff out there and that will absorb the energy of incoming um, ammunition from the enemy. So our first trench can confirm that this earthwork is a 20 millimetre gun emplacement and it was strategically placed to shoot down low-flying aircraft. Phil's emplacement up on the top here, on the highest point, that's a 20mm gun. That's designed to be quick moving, it's got a rapid rate of fire. And as we know this shape is a 20mm gun, we can confidently say that all these features are also 20mm guns, which isn't a bad result for one day's digging. These larger 88mm gun pits will be our main target for tomorrow as we begin to extend our investigation. 
because it's now clear that this whole hillside operated as one big settlement. So far, we've only been digging about a third of this battery, and Stuart feels it's about time to investigate another target at the other end of the site. You know, from other flat batteries, you know what to expect. There's a gun, and then there has to be a, a fire and command control centre close to the guns, and sometimes have a shelter for the crew underneath, like a bunker or something like that. Not necessarily concrete, could be dug down into yeah. the rock or the earth. Well, I mean, the results don't necessarily suggest concrete bunker, but certainly something that's going deep into the ground and appears to have collapsed and be full of rubble. Mm. That's hard ground, isn't it? So we're opening a new trench over a potential bunker, and very quickly it becomes clear there's something rather interesting deep down. Look at this red here. There's some tile. Oh, right, it's a tile. A oh, brick. And then we discover the last thing we need. Ian, I think that's perhaps where we stop, because I think we've got some form of ordnance going on. And this time it's not a stray bullet. Yeah, it looks like a very real, very live artillery shell. Hi. These rock-cut trenches would appear to show the determination of the German troops here to defend their positions against Allied attack. But there could be a chance that the soldiers didn't do the digging themselves. Because our site overlooks the most impressive and most chilling monument to the German occupation. About 100 feet above my head, Phil and the rest of the team are excavating our German anti-aircraft battery. But down here, there's a much more tangible example of the German occupation. This is the Jersey War Tunnels, originally created as an artillery workshop and military hospital for the Germans. But if ever there's a statement that says, we're powerful, we're here, and we're not going away, this is it. Hewn out of solid rock, the tunnels are a testament to German engineering. But they're also a testimonial to the brutal Nazi ethos that some people deserved to be treated as subhuman. There is something phenomenally bleak about that unfinished tunnel, isn't there? There is. It was built by people who worked for the organisation TOTE. And these were voluntary labour, there's um, coerced labour, forced labour, slave labour. People from from Russia, from Poland, from Belarus, from Ukraine. People who in the, the Nazi racial hierarchy were right down there. Did many of them die? Yes, yes, hundreds in, uh, in Alderney and um, around about 100 in Jersey. It's a sobering reminder as we reach the end of day two that what we're digging had a real and lasting impact on the people of Jersey. Stuart, this turned up earlier. And we're still discovering yet more evidence of the force used to occupy this island. Well, it's an 88 shell case, that's for sure. Well, I think the, the actual gain for the, uh, the primer of the shell case is still present, so uh, it's potentially dangerous. Back at the heart of the site, the scale of the gun emplacements that fired those shells is now evident. That looks a bit like a firing step there. Well, that's what we think. Um, this one's different to all these other shelters in that it's got that out there. Now, if you, if you look through, actually what you've got is a field of fire down that trench system and covering that area out in the woodland beyond. So it makes sense to have a sort of secondary defence line here. Defending this hill from a land-based attack appears to have become more important in the latter years of the war, and we're now confident another one of our trenches is also part of this re-fortification. It's a machine gun post. Heck of a lot of hard work. You can see it was cut out of the solid rock, and it's part of the network of defences that we can see pretty clearly on the 1944 aerial photo. But intriguingly, we're starting to find things that aren't on that photo, like this big structure behind you, Martin. What is it? Right, well, it begins life. You can see it on there. It's the same sort of position as that first trench fill did. But they've dished in one side of it here to create this big bank there. So it's stopped being about anti-aircraft defence, and actually it's become part of this system, and it's providing extra fire support for the guys who are down there in your machine gun. So it's a shifting from attack to defence? Quite right, yes. How does that tie in with history? Well, 
this photo was taken in August, I think, 1944. And if you think June 1944, everything has changed because you've had the Allied landings in Normandy. So suddenly the Allies, they're, they're only 14 miles away in France. So it's a completely different game they're suddenly having to play here. They are now cut off not just from Britain, they're also cut off from France. So the irony is that the Germans here who were the besiegers had now suddenly become the besieged. Completely. So, so we always think of D-Day as this big moment when the war turned, but things just got worse for everybody here. We can now concentrate on working out what we've actually uncovered on site. And it's clear that by the end of the war, the Germans had built a sophisticated complex of trenches against ground attack. I just can't believe how big this thing is. Meanwhile, Rakshar and Phil, fresh from the beach, have revealed an 88mm emplacement as robust as any Roman archaeology we've ever uncovered. We've got that little bunker area over there. We can actually see now where all the timber revetment is. But the main thing is, this is a seriously big piece of engineering for a seriously big gun. While over in Faye's trench, we've also got something equally robust. But this time, it's underground. Well, down at the bottom now, we've actually got the base of this structure. And what we think we've got, you see the depth of it, is something from a bunker. And we've got all these cables and wires coming in. So I think we've got a communication bunker. Could this be the brains of the whole operation? I don't think it's big enough to be the brains of the whole operation, but potentially some of it, yes. This building here is a command and control centre. That's where Faye's digging. Yes, right in that trench, trench that down trench. there, yeah. yeah. So, with all this information, what does our man in the sand pit think? Because we've excavated around 20 millimetre battery, you know what that's like? We can see others on the aerial photograph. Yep. And we've got a number of them ringing around the site. The 88 millimetre ones are square. They're very different to the 20 yep. millimetre ones. There's a, a nice triangular pattern of three there. Yep. And over in where we're standing, nice triangle geometric pattern. So, you can imagine, if they're firing, at 15 rounds a minute, that's 45 rounds from each of these batteries a minute, times two, 90 rounds a minute, these batteries can pump up into the sky. That's serious, that's serious air defence, is that. But you can see how they just went from being an anti-aircraft battery suddenly to having to think almost in infantry mode. This is the weakest side, they're expecting attacks up here, and you can see they're also, in this trench system, they're digging a trench along the back of the hedge line now, and they're going to use the hedge and the bank underneath it as part of the defences against any attack here. It, it's not just anti-aircraft. It's about controlling the airfield, and it's an anti-invasion defence at the same time. So we've got a fortified enclosure as sophisticated as any Iron Age hill fort, with six massive guns capable of throwing up a barrage of exploding shells, while 20 millimetre gun emplacements dealt with lower flying aircraft. But by the end, it was a fortress where starving troops lived in fear of invasion, and the 88 millimetre guns, including the one in Phil's trench, were now lowered to overlook the island below. Well, basically, we've got a sort of a, what I like to think of as a cross between a Roman fort and a, and a wooden box. The Roman fort bit is the bank that goes all the way around. That gives you your protection. The wooden box bit is the fact that all these edges would have been revetted with timber. And, in fact, when you'd have come in here, you'd have seen wooden sides and wooden flooring, and in each corner you'd have had an ammunition box there and an ammunition box there and probably one over there. But the central part is really what strikes you. It is an enormous hole that is filled up with concrete. Yeah, and right in the middle of it, there's the one thing that's missing, which is that enormous metal killing machine. Absolutely. But you can just see the imprint of where it once stood. You've got these bolts here where it's actually been fixed to the concrete. And clearly, at the end of the war, they cut them all off except one, and then they lifted the gun away and, thank God, took it away. Time Team is 100% independent and funded by our incredible fans. Joining Patreon gives you access to exclusive interviews, 
3D models, masterclasses, and more. Please join us on this exciting journey. We need more support to make more episodes. In early 2006, a light aircraft flew across the north coast of Anglesey on an aerial survey of the island. Then the photographer spotted something strange and took this photo. It revealed a massive earthwork about the length of two football pitches and on an island that was once home to one of history's most mysterious groups, accused of magical rituals, human sacrifice, even cannibalism, the Druids. So what exactly is this strange earthwork? As usual, we've got just three days to find out. Mick, we've got this huge site here, clearly visible. Yeah. And yet nobody's ever dug it. That seems a puzzle to me. Not only have they never been dug, but they've hardly been recognised. Even the great survey of Anglesey done in the 1930s just said a few scrappy earthworks mainly destroyed. Are they mostly destroyed? <laughs> no, it doesn't look like it, does it? I mean, there's huge great banks and ditches. Have you any idea what period it is? Well, they just suggested it might be Roman, but I don't think we know, really. Dating this massive earthwork is going to be critical. If it's Roman, then it's the product of one of the bloodiest episodes in Welsh history. In AD 61, the full force of the Roman army descended on this small island. Their mission? To destroy the stronghold of the British resistance, an insurgency led by the Druids. In a merciless attack unprecedented on British soil, they massacred the Druids and their followers, and burnt down their sacred oak groves. But if our earthwork was built before the Roman invasion, then it could be a remnant of the very people the Romans set out to destroy, a relic of a lost world dominated by the Druids. So we put in three trenches over the large rectangular feature. Phil opens a trench over what looks like the entrance, Matt looks inside the rectangle in the hope of finding evidence of settlement. And Bridge opens a trench across what Mick thinks might be a stone rampart. We'll have two bucket widths from there, that shoulder, that line. Go, let's do it. The relentless elements have made the ground bone dry. Digging's going to be tough. You've got the natural where it comes over the rise, yeah. and then you've got the natural there, just in between there. That's not some sort of ditch. Where? Oh, look at that. He, he spotted that. He felt it in the you finger. You should swap jobs, I think. Hey! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Phil, with more than a little help from Ian, has uncovered what appears to be the entrance to the enclosure. The ditch across the front would have made it impossible to approach the entrance directly. It looks defensive, but is it Roman or Iron Age? An imperial fort or the last refuge of the Druids? I know we've got evidence of Iron Age counts in this part of the country, but do we actually have tangible evidence of Druids? If you go over to a, another corner of, of the island, to RAF Valley Anglesey, back in the 1940s, Workmen, not archaeologists, discovered in the peat, where there had once been a lake, uh, cr close on 150 objects of iron and bronze. And we have um, some replica examples here and some images. This image of a bronze decorative plaque. Think of this as the Mercedes-Benz sign on the front of your fancy car, but put this on the front of your wagon or chariot. And the question is, who was directing the dumping, now let's use a better word, deposition, gifting of these objects, including um, swords, they'd been bent and broken before they were thrown into the lake. Who was doing that? So this is what Francis would call ritual deposition, just like you have on your own site at Flagfen right. over in Cambridgeshire. Yes, absolutely. This is, this is one of the classic ritual sites. Uh, throughout Britain and Europe, you, you have deposition of offerings into bogs and wet places, it is a religious activity, mm. and it's only towards the end of that period, in the last three or so centuries, that it actually gets attributed to the Druids. They were the blokes doing the mm. stuff. 
We've put a trench over some exposed stones that Mick thinks could be a rampart. Bridge has cleaned them up and they're looking good. Well, Mick, this is fantastic. We don't usually find archaeology like this on day one. It looks we? very impressive, doesn't it? Yeah. But it's not what we're looking for at all. <laughs> what do you mean? Well, I thought it was probably part of some sort of Iron Age rampart structure. Sure. Well, of course, the problem is it's outside the enclosure. It's the wrong side of it. And it now looks as if it's the end of a barn or a building going off in that direction. And it turns out to be much more to do with a post-medieval farm site. <laughs> post-medieval? Yeah. Round about when, do you reckon? 1800, something like that, <laughs> probably. <laughs> if you look at that enclosure on the map, and you yeah. look at this bottom half badly affected by later ploughing, and that being post-medieval farm, then yeah. our best bet for getting the outline of this enclosure is going to be up the top there. Yeah. Have you Got followed it. this so I've far? I've followed it so far. Could you explain it back to me so that I understand? <laughs> In the relentless wind, our plans and our minds are taking a battering. But as the clouds gather yet again, the archaeology begins to shine through. Ah, Francis. Yeah? I was saying there's not a lot of hope for this trench. There's actually a coin down here. Oh, hey. Perhaps this can help us to date the earthwork. Look, a Ooh. coin. It's out of context, but could be dateable. Now, that's come off that spoil tip over there. And that looks to me like something early, exact early Roman exactly. rather than later, doesn't exactly. it? Exactly. So Both trenches seem to be getting deeper and deeper. Nine feet yeah. deep. <laughs> 2.7 metres. Well, I mean, I'm absolutely speechless. What a tree. But what's amazing is how what a small space it's fitted into. I mean, we never thought it was going to go that deep. Do you think that it tells us anything, that shape, that incredible depth and narrowness? Well, I mean, normally, if you see something as narrow and steep and V-shaped as that, you'd say Roman. But we don't know that is its shape. No. And if it was Roman, I'd expect to see a lot of pottery knocking around We haven't had heads. a whisker of a nothing, find out. Nothing at all. No charcoal, no... no. no. And Let's... we've really tried hard to find something. Just as things are getting really interesting, the weather we've been battling all day wins. Beginning of day two here in Anglesey, and we're just beginning to come to grips with this strange earthwork which covers this entire sloping field. Yesterday we found a big ditch which Francis swears is Iron Age and if he's right that would be great because it would mean that the people who lived here would have practiced the Druidic religion and would have witnessed the horrible cataclysmic events that occurred when the Romans invaded, except Francis. <laughs> Having said all that, we haven't got any proof at all that this ditch is Iron Age, have we? No, and I don't expect to get much. Great. <laughs> <laughs> Tony, you don't get Iron Age pottery in this yeah. part of the world. Yeah. The depth of the ditch is fine. I'm quite relaxed about yeah. that. What yeah. about the shape of it? Does, does that help you at all? Yeah, that's fine. I mean, there are a number of examples of that shaped enclosure around sort of farmsteads in right. this part of the world. It's yeah. not actually rectangular, is it? Well, no, I mean, that, I think that's the point, though. It's not as if it's been laid out carefully, is it? It's a rock square. So, so what might that imply? I would guess it's more native than Roman. No Roman army has come along with textbooks and no, measures, no. have they? And no, that's, that, right, that's right, that's right. Look, look, in that field over there. I mean, this is absolutely... I, I just, just as you're flying round, I can hardly take my eyes off all these field systems you can see in the yeah. fields around. It seems the farmers were spot on about the shapes in the field next door. Very circular features, I can see field bound. They see a trackway or a droveway yeah. going down there, which is what you'd expect. I mean, what it does show is that the enclosure that we've got is at the heart of a very active prehistoric Roman yeah. period landscape. Yeah. It's not sitting by itself, is it? But what's the connection between our Iron Age enclosure on the hill and the shapes in the next field? We're sending in Geophys to have a look and extending our search for the people who built this earthwork even further. Which might not be such a bad idea, because back in our enclosure, we're struggling to find any trace of them. We've widened Matt's trench over the deep ditch so we can get down and dig it out by hand. And Phil's still plugging away at the entrance. But so far, they're both empty. 
If someone mentions druids nowadays, we tend to think of hippies in white sheets on Salisbury Plain, don't we? But do we have much tangible evidence that they actually existed in ancient times? We must be careful because whose territory are you on now? You're in Wales and we have living druids, our own intelligentsia. Caesar tells us that the druids in Gaul, France today, which he happened to be conquering at the time, uh, that they came over to Britain uh, to study. That is the best teaching, the best source of learning. So what was this knowledge that they were imparting? Well, I mean, there seem to have been three types of druids. Basically a priesthood and then soothsayers, sometimes called ovates or vates from the Latin, and bards, and it's the bards we see a lot of in Wales because they're the poets and the singers and, and the artists. But we can broaden their role. You know, were they the scientists? You know, we use, it's a modern term, scientists. They were uh, foretellers of the future. Um, we are also told that battles between the native peoples, the pre-Roman peoples, their own peoples, they'd come in as actual peacemakers. Mm. So they knew that they're playing many roles. But that's not how the Romans saw the Druids, is it? They saw them as blood-drinking cannibals. Tony, as you know, the natives didn't do the writing. It's the Romans who tell us the story. It's a story that includes blood-curdling accounts of elaborate human sacrifice. But is that just Roman propaganda? Or could the Druids really have conducted such ceremonies? With a vast network of fields and a massive strategically placed hilltop enclosure, this was more than just a simple farm. Whoever controlled it must have been a powerful chief. So with time running out, we concentrate all our resources on the main enclosure. Everyone that is, except Henry. He's wandered down to a boggy area in the valley to take a core of soil. The grey stuff at the bottom is 2,000-year-old mud. It's a sign that in the Iron Age, this bog was a lake. This is so typical of you. On day one, you prowled around the site. On day two, you moved into the next field. And now we're, what, 200 metres away in the middle of a bog? Yes. It's all about landscape context, Tony. I keep banging on about it, but knowing something about a site isn't, it isn't sufficient in itself unless you know something about the landscape that site lived within and how it developed. And where we've walked to down here doesn't particularly look like it to you, perhaps, but this was a large lake here in prehistory. So what do you think the relationship would have been between the lake and the people who lived up there? Well, there's, there's two relationships. One is very practical. One is supply of water, and from the crop marks we do have evidence now in the field where Bridget's digging of a trackway which actually leads down from the fields towards this bog. They're bringing animals down to, to water them, so that's very practical. But of course the other is ritual, once you get into prehistory, that awful word, but we do know that lakes and bogs become areas where in prehistory people are depositing votive offerings, metal work. So they're actually chucking it into the lake? That's right. These are spe really are special places in prehistory. So there might still be Iron Age objects in this bog that I, were cast in 2,000 years ago? I, I think that's the case. We're yeah. not going to be able to dig it, are we? No, I mean, there's no, I mean it's actually very large. There's no way you'd, you'd even attempt to dig something like this. We'll let it lie. <laughs> From his hilltop home, the Iron Age chieftain who ruled this corner of Anglesey could see the source of his power, economic and spiritual, laid out before him. And he made sure that anyone looking back could see it too. If you remember, the geophys showed another ditch yeah. on the outside of the main big ditch. So we put this trench in. And what we discovered wasn't what we thought. It wasn't another ditch. Right. But we came across these big rocks. We yeah. found about five of these. And they went in, the, in a line across the trench here. So I put an extension in. Yeah. And I think that's the foot of a wall. So you got a wall through here. We got a wall. This, in other words, the bank that accompanied the big ditch yeah. had a revetment, right. stone revetment. To stop all this stuff tipping it over. Yes, yeah. but it, well, I mean, we've just got the bottom of it. It may well have been higher. Yeah. In which case, you could have seen a stone wall 
down there in the valley. Yeah. And it would have looked you know, really spectacular. And it sort of enhances this impression that this is a very high status, important site. It would have looked like a fort on the yes. horizon, wouldn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. In an imposing structure like this, we'd expect to find substantial houses. So you're happy that there were actually Iron Age people building shelters here, not just putting up fences? Yes, well, I think it's more than shelters. I yes, it's houses. It's, this would be a substantial house, you know, the way people have reconstructed, they're quite substantial buildings. Their reconstructions show these were simple but brilliant designs. Carefully placed posts bore the weight of the roof and defined the large communal space. And a thatched roof would have kept out the very worst Welsh weather. It was the perfect house for this hill, a substantial weatherproof home fit for even the most powerful chieftain. Yeah. Is that going yeah. down? Yeah. That's going down? Yeah. yeah. Even Francis wouldn't get this excited about a rubbish pit. Oh, this is looking oh, good! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hang on, I see another of these yellowy stones just yeah. under there. There, yeah. yeah. This, right, this... so what it looks like then, Francis, is a kiss. So it'll be a, a little grave, yeah, possibly, take... lined with stone and probably, what, Bronze Age, early Bronze Could Age? Be. Well, it certainly is the appropriate size and shape for a crouched inhumation. If yeah. you know yeah. so much about it, do you really want me to bother and dig it? <laughs> <laughs> This is completely unexpected. Looking for signs of Iron Age settlement, it seems we've found a Bronze Age grave, not two, but 4,000 years old. The oval grave was lined with large flat stones. The body would have been curled up inside. It seems the acidic soil has destroyed the bones, but the discovery helps us rewrite the history of this hill. We're saying those post holes are about 2,000 years old, and that burial is about 4,000 years old. In other words, the people who were looking at that burial were as far away from it in time as we are from the Romans. But think now, if there were a heap of stone over this burial pit, yeah. It was there, it was being respected by the builders of these new houses. From his hilltop home, the Iron Age chieftain who ruled this corner of Anglesey could see the source of his power, economic and spiritual, laid out before him. And he made sure that anyone looking back could see it too. If you remember, the geofish showed another ditch yeah. on the outside of the main big ditch. So we put this trench in, and what we discovered wasn't what we thought. It wasn't another ditch. Right. But we came across these big rocks. We yeah. found about five of these, and they went in, the, in a line across the trench here. So I put an extension in. Yeah. And I think that's the foot of a wall. So you got a wall through here. We got a wall. This, in other words, the bank that accompanied the big ditch yeah. had a revetment, right. stone revetment. To stop all this stuff tipping it over. Yes, but yeah. it, well, I mean, we've just got the bottom of it. It may well have been higher. Yeah. In which case, you could have seen a stone wall down there in the valley. Yeah. And it would have looked you know, really spectacular. And it sort of enhances this impression that this is a very high status, important site. It would have looked like a fort on the yes. horizon, wouldn't it? Yes. Yeah. yeah. In an imposing structure like this, we'd expect to find substantial houses. But so far, the only sign of Iron Age occupation is a series of small post holes. They don't look much, but Mick and Francis are impressed. It's probably the best evidence we're going to get for settlement on this site, for actual buildings and structures, isn't it? Yes, but dating them with any precision is impossible, other than by absence of pottery. But they're right in the centre of our enclosure, yeah. which is where we know they ought to be. So they're at the centre of power, if you like. And if we could join them all up into coherent pattern, I think we'd find there would be roundhouses about sort of eight metres diameter, yeah. thatched roof, yeah. that sort of thing. But the posts can't have been very big. They're pretty small No, holes. but I think the problem is, you see, we're seeing just the bottom bit yeah. of the post hole. All the rest of it, the actual 
foot or more in which the post has been eroded by ploughing across this site. We're right at the bottom of them. So you're happy that there were actually Iron Age people building shelters here, not just putting up fences? Well, yes. I think it's more than shelters. I yes, think it's houses. This, this would be a substantial house, you know, the where people have reconstructed. They're quite substantial buildings. And at nearby Mellon Clernon, a team of experimental archaeologists and modern builders are demonstrating just how substantial. Their reconstructions show these were simple but brilliant designs. Carefully placed posts bore the weight of the roof and defined the large communal space. And a thatched roof would have kept out the very worst Welsh weather. It was the perfect house for this hill, a substantial weatherproof home fit for even the most powerful chieftain. Three days ago, this earthwork was almost unheard of. One of the few clues to its existence was a photograph. Now we've uncovered 4,000 years of history on this Welsh hillside. It begins with one person, buried but not forgotten. Because 2,000 years later, this hill was still a special place, the power base for an important chieftain. It gave him a link to the past, shelter, food, even a sacred lake. He had it all. And then the Romans arrived. Life on Anglesey and on this hill changed forever. The curiously empty ditches suggest wind and rain began to fill them with earth soon after the invasion. The roundhouse post holes were covered by a blanket of soil and a Roman coin dropped on top. It seems the chief and his people vanished and the once mighty earthwork was abandoned. The roundhouses fell into disrepair or were even demolished. And the terrifying events of the Roman invasion were hidden beneath gentle pasture. This exposed hill bears witness to the island's darkest hour. David, it's really come on, hasn't it? Yes, it has. Uh, growing nicely. We're almost on the last stage. Despite dry willow and strong winds, Dave and his team have proved it would have been possible for the Iron Age Celts to build a wicker man. Let me show you the head. Does that remind you of anybody? As Dave puts the finishing touches to our wicker man, it's easy to forget that 2,000 years ago, this would have been a gruesome spectacle. But stuffed with straw instead of humans, it's far from terrifying. In fact, it feels strangely familiar. Drink to you, mate. Phil certainly seems to be feeling a connection. <laughs> It's tempting to find faint echoes of this ancient custom in our modern traditions, from corn dollies and the green man to Guy Fawkes. How much of the ancient British way of life did the Romans really destroy? How much do we owe to that elusive elite, the Druids? Time Team is 100% independent and funded by our incredible fans. Want us to make more episodes? Joining Patreon gives you access to exclusive interviews, 3D models, masterclasses and more. And you get to have your say in the process as we develop new sites. The mysterious ruins of Hopton Castle still bear the scars of a tragic past. 400 years ago, this fortress was torn apart by a civil war siege. The small band of defenders inside, who were loyal to Parliament, gave their lives defending it against an army of King Charles I. Today, only the tower survives as witness to their heroic last stand, and nobody's got any idea what the rest of this castle looked like. So that's where we come in. We've been invited here by the local preservation society to try to find out and maybe to solve a little mystery along the way. Richard, you're our castle's expert, and you want us not only to sort out what the castle looked like during the Civil War, but to address the issue of a war crime. 
because not only is it a fantastic site, it's got a fantastic story with the Civil War siege and these brave garrison holding out against the Royalists for several weeks before finally surrendering and then being rather brutally murdered. Most of what we know about the siege of Hopton comes from a man called Colonel Samuel Moore, the garrison commander. He wrote it all down in his journal and it reads like a novel. Dead. He says that the Royalists attacked the outnumbered defenders three times, losing hundreds of men. It was only when the attackers had the parliamentarians cornered in the tower that they finally gave up. Well, first thing first, and that is to find out what this place looked like. So GFIs get to work looking for buildings. Six then. OK, thanks. And Stuart, our landscape investigator, starts hunting for the castle's ramparts. From its shape, we suspect our Civil War castle may be medieval in origin. It fits the classic model of a modern bailey, which is basically a big tower on a mound with a defensive ring below it. Suppose right. we start a trench somewhere about there. Yes. It means Phil and Bill, the local English heritage inspector, can make an educated guess where the outer wall might be. This wall, which we think might be part of the original medieval castle and yeah. might have been refurbished in the Civil War, yeah. down into what we think might have been part of the original backfield ditch, yeah. and then up onto this bank, which is probably going to be part of the defences or the assault in the Civil War. Yes? Yes. That's what you call a turf, that is. That's Axminster, that is, Faye. Alone and with no sign of relief, for three weeks, the 30-odd men behind these walls held out against hundreds of Royalist soldiers. And over in his trench, Phil thinks he may have found the first evidence of fighting. We've got a musket ball. It's a bit splattered, but it's definitely a musket ball. But is it Civil War? I don't know, but given the site that we're on, I bet it is. So, we're in the right period, but are we going to find the bloke who was on the other end of this? We'll know later. Phil's looking for the old castle wall and the moat, where we think we might find traces of the first attack. This bank here, was, was we thought originally might be part of the medieval castle defences. Well, we've gone down through it and we're getting masses and masses of brick. Oh, brick. But more importantly, we're beginning to get pottery too. You see here, I mean, here's the base of a pot. And here's another piece of pot, little tiny handle. But, I mean, this stuff is clearly not medieval. Still, if his rampart is from the Civil War, does it fit into the history? Uh, the 26th of February is the first attack. Over the next few days, Field Marshal Helen Geek is going to do a spot of war gaming. Now, there's a, there's a body of foot who, who approach the out walls. Along with Richard, our castle's expert, she's going to compare Colonel Moore's account of the battle with what we find in our trenches. So let's put um, some more on. OK. And they were... But it's what happened after the siege that really intrigues me. So, the guys from the garrison who died could be over there where they're geophysing, mm -hmm. or they could be somewhere completely different. It's just pot luck whether we find them or not. Is there anything that you've read in any of the documents that could narrow down the search for us? Yeah, I think so. I mean, the first one says it's a cellar. Now, we ought to be able to find a cellar with geophysics, and it would be very recognisable if we do encounter it. That's one good hypothesis that we can test, that they might be in a cellar. The second one is that all the sources concur in saying that they're, they're somewhere near water, mud or water. And so I think that we could go for, for anywhere that's waterlogged um, or with standing water and have a look round there and see what we can find. Well, John's been busy doing geophys and he thinks he might have picked up a good candidate for a cellar not far from the tower. John, you've done the inner bailey. What's it show? It's pretty good. I mean, we've done mag and res, and I think we're starting to see clear buildings inside. Look at the magnetics to start with. So the white line is showing what I think is a big structure there, and the black on the inside, it's either midden deposits, areas of burning. In the resistance, you can also see that the shadow oh, outline yeah. of buildings. Now, what I think we've got in front of us here you can see it clearly yes, in the earthworks. Pretty as obvious, well, isn't it? Yeah. You know, but 
we've got a wall going underneath that hawthorn bush. I think it actually turns through a right angle and comes back underneath our feet. Our second trench goes in to see if we've got a cellar. So that's one possibility for the mass grave. But what about the muddy ditch? I'd assumed that our whole team were over here trying to sort out the castle until I saw this little head bobbing up and down behind these rather nasty nettles. Henry, what are you doing? Once I get to the bottom with the, with the auger, when I look at the soil down there, I will be able to tell whether it's flowing water through there or whether it's still water or whether it's just a muddy hole. Some of the documents say the dead bodies were found in a muddy pit. Right. You could be giving us some evidence, couldn't you? Yeah, no, this, this should tell part of that story, yeah. Phil's doggedly digging away, trying to work out the shape of the castle. He's changed his tune from this morning. He now reckons we do have a wall. It's just underneath the earth bank he found earlier. All right. Look at it. Look at that. Yeah. It's the, yeah. the burning is running underneath. So the, the construction of that bank is later than that burning. You know, I just I do wonder what the hell all this burning is, though. Well, we know the buildings were burnt during the siege. Oh, well, exactly. You see, you, you just make you wonder. It looks like by the time of the Civil War, the Inner Bailey was surrounded by a small and rather unimpressive wall. And instead of a moat, it had earthworks. And at the centre of it could be a very large building. It looks like we're coming onto a sort of different level here. We've been through this incredibly loose, yeah. compacted brick deposit. Yeah. Which I yeah. guess is what? Do you think the walls of the building? Yeah. This is beginning to be more like one of those crime scene investigation shows than a time team. Bit of gold. But then, as is always the case on time team, something turns up which you don't expect. I heard some bleeping and the words gold. Oh, yes. We've got a gold hammered coin. Oh, wow. Yeah, it was spoiled from the bottom of this trench. <sighs> This extraordinary thing about gold, that when it does come out, it just shines straight away, doesn't it? It does, yes. As if it was put there yesterday. Look at your face. <laughs> You're quite pleased, aren't you? Very pleased. <laughs> it's made my year. Helen's got to double-check the date, but could this gold coin have been dropped by one of the garrison or even by their killers? In the hands of trained soldiers and at close quarters, muskets were deadly. It makes Moore's claim to have shot and killed hundreds of royalists at the breach sound much more plausible. But where did this happen? Our armchair generals are playing toy soldiers to find out. So they're through the breach, mm -hmm. most, most of the 200, so it's at yeah. least 100. They're within the breach, but not within our, our works, but as in a pinfold in the circumference of the burnt lodging. What is a pinfold? It's basically a very large sheep pen. It's for sorting out sheep. So they're caught in a trap? Yeah, so they can't move. Yes, yeah. Yes. So do you know where that first breach in the wall happens? I have very strong suspicions, Helen, it's in this area down here. Anybody coming through this narrow gap in the breach will be trapped. They could be fired down from there, from there. They're literally trapped like sheep in a, in a sheepfold. If Stuart's right, then somewhere here should be a range of buildings which resemble a sheep pen. As well as giving us a direct link to the history, if we do have structures here, they'd make this castle far larger than we first thought. We're going to have to ponder this one over a few beers tonight. But before we can down tools and raise glasses... Whoa! <laughs> My goodness! We've got our hands full with yet another remarkable find from the cellar. I think that's a cannonball. In fact, I'd put even money on that being a cannonball. So could this mean we're close to the end of the siege? Do you feel how heavy that is, Tony? Just that little bit of it is some weight, isn't it? Yeah. Imagine that coming crashing in through the walls and landing right in the bottom of the cellar. I'm in no doubt now that this is the brick dwelling house referred to in the siege accounts. And what we know is that the defenders set fire to it to stop the royalists using it. So I guess what we've got here is evidence of burnt timbers, being fired on with ordnance, surely this now locks us in the history and archaeology together. 
What a beautiful spot you brought me to. Get a lovely view of the castle here. But <laughs> there's nothing here. Ah, there is something here, though, because if you look in this area over here, Phil, there are lots of lumps and bumps that suggest there might have been buildings here and walls, that there were things blocking this end up here. And for once, I agree with Stuart. <laughs> <laughs> What's that there, going that way? Here? Yeah. That's my wall. Matt's found the far end of our brick building. And it isn't just a house, it's a mansion. In fact, it was so big, the builders had to fill in the moat around the tower just to squeeze it into the bailey. Ah! Our archaeology has now built up a terrifying picture of the final 48 hours of the defenders' lives. And it backs up Colonel Moore's journal in every detail. After being bombarded by constant fire with the attackers through the breach, the defenders set the brick mansion on fire before fleeing to the tower. A terrifying sequence of events which we found in both the archaeology and the documents. They were now at the mercy of the royalist commander, Sir Michael Woodhouse, and Richard thinks he's worked out how he forced them to surrender. All I had to do is run up the bank, and attack that. That looks like a door, but yeah. it's actually a window opening. Now, they're trapped on the top floor. They can't do anything about people attacking the bottom of the castle. So this is another example of this building not really doing its job as a defence because it had a vulnerable window close to the ground. Yes, because the window, either side of the window, the wall is only about that thick. So it's dead easy to actually bash through. I think what we can see there is what was done during the Civil War. And that's what makes them give up, because they think that they're going to lay explosives and they say it's better to surrender than to be blown up. Yeah. Extraordinary, isn't it, to see something so vulnerable from all those years ago that led to such a terrifying end. Yeah. It's ironic that the strongest-looking part of the castle, the tower, was actually the weakest. And everything we found over the past few days suggests that in both medieval times and during the Civil War, Hopton was more of a country house than a castle. It's turned our knowledge of this place on its head and explains why the defenders failed to hold on to it. But it also begs the question, why did Moore and his men defend a hopeless cause? Why did Moore refuse to surrender when he had three opportunities to do so? It's difficult to explain. We can only think that he must have been inspired by religious fanaticism or by the belief that God would come to his aid or because he was terribly afraid of the Royalist Army. He'd possibly been reading the newspapers as well and hearing these stories about the massacre of helpless prisoners and he possibly didn't trust the Royalists' offer of quarter. What about the other side? Why did Woodhouse allow such a terrible atrocity to take place? Well, that's the really difficult question to answer. Somehow, we were off the map of chivalry, and chivalry and honour did operate in most of these Civil War encounters. There were rules that you could follow, like table manners. Um, the fact that the first offers of quarter ref were refused may have made him feel that they were off the map. But I suspect one of the accounts of the massacre says that Woodhouse left his men to themselves for three hours. It was normal royalist behaviour, but in this case they seem to have been particularly violently inspired, and that might be the cause of the massacre. But evidence of that massacre continues to elude us. With no signs of a mass grave anywhere else, we were praying that we'd find one at the bottom of the cellar. But alas, as the day draws to a close, we've got to admit defeat. You're kind of performing the last rites on this trench then, aren't you, Phil? Well, I reckon I am. So you're completely convinced that's natural, are you? Well, look, here's the bottom of the wall. Yeah, you're built bottom. right on top. Absolutely. I know, I think this is a deposit that not even a parliamentarian or a royalist ever saw. But while we haven't found any bodies, we're pretty confident our cellar does match one description of where the men were said to have been killed. It's unfinished, without any plaster, 
And it's also at the bottom of a burning building. And what about it being full of stinking water? Well, most intriguingly of all, computer modelling suggests that our cellar was liable to flooding as well. Who knows? Perhaps this was their place of execution after all. After the battle was over, Hopton was left a smoking ruin. The tower was badly damaged and fell into disrepair. For several weeks, a small band of men had turned this country house into a small fortress and held out against overwhelming and terrifying odds. 400 years on, we've pieced together their last stand and discovered the magnificent 17th century chamber block where they fought and may have died. This morning, Neil, you said to me, Tony, the excavation of this trench will unveil the story of this castle. Has it done that? Oh, it has. The archaeology has worked out so well. What we've now found is this huge post-medieval cellar. It's about 20 metres long, and above that, you've got to imagine a two- or three-storey brick house. And it's placed here to deliberately to replace that. That was old-fashioned, old news. If you had money, this is how you lived. Imagine chimneys, fancy windows, plastered ceilings. This was all mod cons. It is ironic that the new building should have been burnt down and the garrison retreat to the old one. Absolutely. At the time of the war, forget the word castle. Hopton was a house. And it was, fighting was taking place in all sorts of places during the Civil War, not just on set-piece battlefields, not just at storming of castles, but everyday houses were being attacked and bloody murder was taking place at close quarters. Hello, my name's John Gator. Time Team is fan-funded by Patreon. This vital support helps us to make new episodes. Joining Patreon gives you access to exclusive interviews, 3D models and masterclasses, plus lots more.